ChatGPT today, ChatGPT 4.5, is at a, uh, an IQ level of 155. It doubles in its intelligence every 5.7 months. It, it doesn't happen every 5.7 months, but within a year's time, it will double twice, which basically means in a couple of years, we will be dealing with IQ levels of 1,500, 2,000, which is 10x the intelligence of the most intelligent humans we know. Understand that this, if, if you're into, I love um, uh, string theory and quantum physics, my level of intelligence now can no longer comprehend it. When, if, you, if you sit with those scientists, they're so intelligent that I don't even understand what they're talking about, let alone understand what the detail is. When our computers reach levels of intelligence that are this high, you won't even know what they're doing. Do you realize that? That basically makes us understand that there is three things that we as you know, government leaders need to think about. One is, what opportunities that th does this bring? Second is, what concerns? And the third is, what are our responsibilities? And I'll try to take us through this very quickly. There are many things in AI that are not ready yet. Most notably, what we call deep reasoning and complex mathematics. So, they, you know, if you told ChatGPT, uh, it takes an hour for a towel to dry on a cloth line, how long would it take 10 towels? It will say 10 hours. It doesn't understand the deep reasoning of they can be hung next to each other. Deep reasoning and complex mathematics, I promise you will be solved in 2024. This is why I say it's the most pivotal year. Automation, multi-layer automation is going to be solved in 2024, which means some uh, startups out there are working on technology where you will go to an AI and say, I want to give you $1,000 and I want you to invest it and give me back 1200 by the end of the year. That's it. That's the only prompt. They will go figure out a product, maybe write a book, maybe publish it on Amazon, maybe do the uh, company structure for you, do the tax payments, do everything with one click. Now you can easily see this with travel, for example. You tell your, uh, your AI, I want to be in London before 11 a.m. in this place in the middle of the city on Tuesday, and it will give you a full, it will look at Google Maps for the traffic in the city, what you should take, it will look at the airlines, it will look at the prices, it will look at the, your credit card, and it will ask you one question and say, do you want me to book it? These are all things that will happen without any breakthrough. So we're not going to have to find any new technology like reinforcement learning or so on and so on. If we end up discovering quantum computing, which is really at the cusp, you know, five, ten years away, uh, or, you know, AGI, Artificial General Intelligence, A ASI, Artificial Super Intelligence, then the whole game changes drastically. But let's not assume that for now. Let's just assume that things will go gradual. So as I said, this means there are opportunities, there are threats, or concerns, and there are responsibilities. I want to start with the concerns and threats because that's an important topic to take out of the way. Anytime I speak about AI, uh, especially on main, uh, you know, mainstream uh, news media, uh, CNN or you know, CBS or whatever, they'll immediately ask me and say, is this an ex existential risk? Will the machines kill all, all of us? Nope. They will not, not because uh, they don't have the potential to. There is a tiny possibility in the very far future that we annoy them enough to get rid of us. But I don't think we will get that far unless we address the immediate, op the, the immediate concerns. And the immediate concerns mainly are government-related concerns. Let me explain that. If you, if you look back at human history and understand that when we were hunter-gatherers, the top hunter in the entire tribe could maybe feed the tribe for a day longer than the bottom hunter. The amount of power in one human didn't really have that much impact. When we became farmers, the top farmer could feed the tribe a week longer. When we automated farming using industrial uh, revolution, the top farmer could actually feed the nation for a week longer. And that kind of automation is because we used a third element, not just our human in intuition or human strength and so on, we used automation, we used the soil to automate the process of creating food. You could see that in the information technology in revolution where you know an accountant in the past could maybe keep four companies accurate, now they can keep a thousand companies accurate because of automation. You just take human ingenuity, put it through an autom automation layer, you get you know, more output. With more output, you also get more power and wealth. So the one that invents those solutions gets a lot of power and wealth. What does that mean? It means that there is a very strong tendency in the coming four to five years for concentration of power. We have to understand that, that your country as a whole, compared to other countries that is more advanced in AI, might be at a 
disadvantage, that your companies are at a disadvantage. So this is one. There is the opposite of that, which is a very interesting paradoxical state that we're in. So while there is concentration of power, there is prolification of risk. What does that mean? Believe it or not, I know this sounds really weird. Walking out of here on my phone, I could click twice if I wanted to, and have a printer delivered to my home within two weeks, where I can print DNA, modified DNA. I am that geeky. I don't want to do it, okay? But there are, there are those who are even more geeky than I am that have the capability to print something analogous to COVID if they wanted to, which basically means that as government, you're going to have that polarity of, do I want to enable innovation and growth? And how do I do it while I keep security and safety of my citizens? That's a very, very, very interesting dilemma that we're about to face. Anyone today, including myself, on the drive home can write down a piece of code that is an AI-enabled piece of code. And that AI-enabled piece of code might actually have a very serious impact. And so government has to keep track of all of this, but at the same time, keep citizens, you know, to keep citizens safe, but also keep innovation and, and freedom grow, going. The third one is what I call end of the truth. And I really ask you to observe the US elections. We're building something that's called Pocket Mo. Pocket Mo is all of my data set, all of my books, all of my talks and, and conversations in an AI that would answer your questions as if it was me. If you look at the videos, you wouldn't know it's not me. It's that accurate. And, and f deep fakes are all over the place. And of course, the most important thing for a government to rule is transparency, it's to un actually understand what's going on. And that idea of the truth becomes quite interesting. Uh, job security, of course, because AI will do some jobs better than our citizens. So how can we retrain, reskill? How can we find maybe UBI, uh, universal basic income, as, a, as an alternative, and so on? I don't want to scare you in all of those. Those are actually very manageable problems if you pay attention to them. Those are manageable problems if you pay attention to them. And my last three years or four years since I wrote Scary Smart, this has been my task. My task was to say, really, this is happening. This is already there. Let's try to work on it.